Passive least resistance. I mean, President Trump talking down the oil price versus uh, the continued bearish news out of Venezuela. Well, you know, oil is a function of a variety of things, as we know, has been for a long time. Uh, certainly, it's a sli supply demand issue, uh, but obviously, geopol geopolitics matter a lot, and Venezuela is a very good example of that. Although Venezuelan production has been down uh, and been going down, uh, there are a number of hot spots around the world, that, potential hot spots beyond just Venezuela. Uh, but ultimately, supply and demand, and uh, uh, OPEC listens to the president, but they are neither the president or OPEC are the final arbiters of oil prices. Right, because neither of them had anything to do with shale at the end of the day, so shale kind of goes on its own. Let's not ignore the unconventional shale world. Exactly, which brings us to um, your world, which is something we saw in earnings, uh, for example, is that you got mixed results when it came to cutting your capex. If you take a look at, say, Concho or uh, Pioneer or Diamondback, they all reacted differently uh, to cutting capex. What does that mean for your world? Well, I, I think we're basically in, in shale 3.0 at this point. So 1.0 was the beginning of the industry. Um, by the way, the, the shale industry, the unconventional industry, has only been around really for 10 years. So unlike the rest of the oil industry, you don't have a lot of data points going too far back. Shell 2.0 was after the, the commodity crash a couple of years ago where everybody had to recover from that and, there, and that's when there was this massive re-equitization as mm -hmm. you know and rebalance uh, balance sheet repair and so on. And now we're at 3.0 where the, I, I like the quote people use where you know you, you not only need to make oil but you need to make money making oil. I like that quote. Exactly. And I think that's the period we're in and so there's a lot of reshuffling among the companies and investors as to who can operate in that uh, regard. And I think that's going to lead to uh, likely consolidation uh, as well, because valuations are generally better both on an absolute and relative basis. And you're going to see intra-basin consolidation. You're probably going to see uh, potentially a number of new entrants uh, coming into the shale. So it's, I think it's fair to say that the M&A war rooms are buzzing a bit. Uh, Osmar, how much of uh, shale 2.0 was driven by cheap money? That is to say, you can get really ready credit. And is that still the case? Are the shale producers still have the same sort of access to credit? I think the, uh, they do have access to capital in a variety of different ways. Uh, the public markets maybe are not as attractive with the correction in, in the stock prices, but there's plenty of equity capital available and still plenty of debt capital available. Um, but I think uh, the companies are listening very carefully to their shareholders, and just because they can raise the capital does not mean they should. And so that makes their job interesting, makes our job quite interesting as well. And you can look at that. That's equity and debt is issuance. You're looking at kind of dry spell considering the last few years that we've had. Uh, Catherine, you're an investor. You have the capital. So do you want to be putting that to work in U.S. shale players? Look, I think shale has been um, exploited uh, quite a bit. Um, so you've seen a lot of investment and the U.S. production grow above 10 million barrels per day. I think oil prices in general, Alex, are going to be topped out and see a structural ceiling about $60 uh, dollars per barrel in WTI because you have oil in the U.S. shale being so efficient and adding so much to production. Then on the flip side, you have Venezuela, which dropped 75 percent in production over the past uh, 15 years. So once you get uh, an, an investment in that area, um, decimated. Once you get investment coming back in, you can see a resumption of production and the potential for that to grow again from 1 million barrels per day where it is now to the three and a half that it was only about 15 years ago. So I think oil prices are going to stay low and, and it's going to be uh, offset, of course, by uh, continued demand and supply coming from the U.S. Mm -hmm. and from Venezuela. So you mentioned sort of more M&A Osmar and sort of the, the war rooms getting ready. Uh, the IPOs that we've seen have been kind of lackluster, like, you know, uh, New Fortress Energy kind of went nowhere uh, after its IPO. What's your pipeline like all across the board? The IPO pipeline remains quite strong. It's just a matter of finding the right time. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be an equilibrium between where companies are willing to issue and investors are willing to buy. But we, we and I think the rest of the street, still maintain a pretty healthy pipeline. Uh, but we haven't really gone into that new issuance period at this point. And I think that will change as the market stabilizes. Um, I will say also a lot of people think oil prices stay where they are, potentially go down, but that's again ignoring the geopolitics. And I think one thing that we is, uh, should be very thankful for, and I think the administration fully understands this, is that um, the unconventional shale business has created a tremendous amount of energy security for the United States. And I would also uh, say from a national security perspective as well. So it's important to maintain a vibrant, um, uh, unconventional shale industry. And I think, that, again, the capital will be there. It's just a matter of finding the right time to start issuing all that uh, new equity.